Dear friends and members of the Gideon Planetarium Observatory, uh, I would like to welcome you uh, for to celebrate with us the Asteroid Day Cyprus, 30th of June, 2022. These are annual celebrations, and uh, we're celebrating the, the Asteroid Day, so happy Asteroid Day to everyone. So, As you most probably understood, we're going to talk about asteroids today and celebrate together the International Asteroid Day. It's a day that was uh, chosen by UNESCO to be celebrated on the 30th of June to commemorate the event in Tunguska 1908. The picture you are seeing in your screen now, we have an asteroid flying to the background of stars. So what are asteroids? To be plain and simple, we just have to say that they are rem rem uh, remainders from the formation of our solar system, and we usually find them in the main asteroid belt, which is found between planets Mars, Mars and Jupiter. But there are also some other asteroids that they are trapped in the orbits of their planets. They also orbit around the star, around our star, the Sun. So, what is asteroid day? So asteroid is a global movement that helps to protect Earth from asteroids. Now, how? We'll see. So we talked about the, to, uh, the reason for celebration um, of this asteroid day, the initial reason that we wanted to commemorate this uh, unique event that was recorded in the, uh, near, hi in the near history. So we, have, uh, we had an event in Russia, in Siberia, uh, on the 30th of June, 1908, where we have an we had an asteroid, or if I may better say a meteor, which exploded uh, before hitting the ground, and it devastated the uh, forest in Siberia. It affected a diameter of 50 kilometers of forest. It destroyed it uh, totally. And uh, this, um, uh, this uh, asteroid, uh, created an explosion. The sound was heard to 1,000 1, kilometers away. It even, uh, someone who was on his Porsche, uh, 120 kilometers away, was uh, was jammed, uh, was pushed off from the uh, waves uh, that were created, the blast uh, waves uh, away off his Porsche, and uh, it created a lot, a lot of damage. Uh, the Russians, the Soviets, uh, that that time were not able to access this place, but they were able to access it uh, many years later. And Alexander will talk to you about this uh, in a couple of minutes. So the Gideon Planetarium Observatory is the Cyprus Regional Coordinator uh, since 2015. Uh, and we are responsible to organize and coordinate events nationwide to create educational programs and incre increase the published the public awareness on asteroids. We do workshops, astronomy courses, and we also do asteroid research. And of course, we have some discoveries. How did it all begin? How did it all begin? Uh, so it was Dr. Brian May. Most probably you all know him. He's a very famous uh, guitarist from the Queen uh, band. He's also an astrophysicist. Uh, Danny Garimine. She's uh, the president of uh, the non-profit organization, B612. Um, uh, Rusty, uh, Rusty Zweikart, Apollo 9 uh, astronaut, and Gregory, uh, Gregory Richter, uh, filmmaker. Um, 51 North is, was his famous, uh, very well-known film. Uh, so, the impact now that we want to create with Asteroid Day is to create the dynamic awareness and educational programs to inspire the world about asteroids, to continue inspiring people, mainly young people, to look up in the sky and get excited about our solar system. And so they will be the new generation that will deal with space exploration and more. Uh, we want to share the information and teach about science, opportunities and risks uh, of asteroids because as we saw uh, in Tangaska event, or uh, we more recently in Chelyabinsk, we uh, are under their threat. <laughs> so uh, nothing to be worried about, I mean, in your everyday life, but it could happen anytime. Uh, so 
uh, we have to take care of it in some ways using our technology. And as I mentioned earlier, research and discoveries. Now, a couple of questions. Why do we need to learn about asteroids and why they are so important? Of course, because they contain amino acids and they are uh, and some other organic materials that they may be responsible for, the, the, for life. But also studying them, we can find out uh, about their role in the formation of our solar system, how we can use their resources. We do asteroid mining. Uh, how can asteroids uh, be important uh, in our lives and uh, how we can find ways to deflect them, to, to be protected. Now, on the left side, uh, I see, excuse me for a second. Okay. On the left side, you see a list with numbers. Next to the numbers, you see the names of some asteroids, and that's the year they were discovered. Now, we also, for example, the first asteroid series, 1801. Then we had the second Pallas, 1802, and so on. And we, we had we reached 1,000 asteroids by 1921. Okay, 120 years. Then, only in a few, in some, in, only in, in 68 years, this number became from 1,000 to 10,000. Then, uh, in 16 years, we had discovered the total number was 100,000. And then by 2020, we had 1 million. And you can see here an anim animation that we got from NASA, Jet Promotion Laboratory in Caltech. This is the animation that was created in the year, in the year 2020 to simulate the own 1 million asteroids that were discovered by that time. So it was a rate of nine asteroid discoveries per day when that time was calculated. Now, by sampling some uh, asteroids in space, we can relate them to some meteorites on Earth. And on Earth, we have uh, uh, around 50,000 meteorites uh, being displayed in museums or being in the laboratories of science centers. So we try to take samples from these uh, asteroids and relate them to our samples to make comparisons and see, uh, see similarities and differences. And uh, on the screen, you see a picture of the Hayabusa 2011 mission. And at the bottom right, you see Hayabusa 2 collecting the uh, sample from Ryugu, asteroid Ryugu, and was returned uh, earlier uh, last year in December 2020 in Australia. And it was shared uh, in uh, a couple of uh, different uh, scientific laboratories uh, to explore it. So as we mentioned earlier, not only asteroids, but meteorites serve as a reminder that we don't have all these small rocks falling, but some of them are large. And we had the example of Chelyabinsk on February 2013, that uh, we had this uh, uh, unexpected visitor from space. It created a lot of damage in the city, but outside the city. And uh, if you can have a, if you if you can see clearly on the left side, it, the, all the um, uh, the meteorites, the small frac uh, fractions of the meteorites, were spread within a, a 20 kilometers uh, diameter. Another uh, mission for asteroids, uh, this one visited uh, asteroid Bennu, NASA's Osiris Rex. It's on its way back uh, to Earth now uh, with another uh, sample from another ancient Carponagis uh, asteroid. This, uh, it, will be, it will come back to Earth next year and uh, on the picture, you can see the um, a screenshot from the live event that we shared from NASA uh, during the collection of the sample. Now, the very well known to us uh, Psyche mission that was uh, lately aborted due to what uh, uh, to, due to software issues, as we were told a couple of days earlier. Uh, this law, this uh, psyche mission um, 
was going to be launched on was supposed to be launched in August this year, but due to software pro, uh, problems, it will not be launched until next year, which is the next possible launch window in July 2023. And hopefully, everything will go on well with the software and uh, be corrected, and it will be launched. More on Psyche, you will hear later on by uh, our colleague, our space scientist. Uh, Katie Dimitri. So, as you most probably already understood, the, all the space agencies, they spent a lot of money to investigate, to explore these asteroids. And uh, we had in, in March, we had the launch of a CubeSat, a very small uh, 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 satellite. Uh, it's called the Near Earth Asteroid Scout Mission, which is going to encounter an asteroid of approximately 20 meters across, and it's using a solar sail. And in September, we'll have the NASA's DART mission that will impact the asteroid Dimorphos. This is a test that will try to deflect after asteroids. This means that if in the future we uh, observe any asteroids heading towards Earth that can be dangerous for our planet, we will try with this experiment to see if we can manage to deflect them. So uh, the DART mission will deflect it. And then another mission from the European Space Agency um, may, called HERA, the HERA space club will meet uh, the deflected asteroid and uh, make some tests, the so-called aftermath of the deflection uh, of the deflection test. So uh, we have to keep an eye on them. We have to be, uh, we have to learn about them and we have to try and discover more because the more we discover, the more we can follow and track them and we can be more safe, hopefully. So uh, that's all for me for, to, for today. And I will be back with you to announce our asteroid discoveries in the end. Uh, and now we will have uh, my colleague, uh, Alexander Prokofiev, our astrophysicist. He will talk to you about the exploration of the Tunguska event that took place in 1908. Uh, Alexander? Thank you, thank you very much. Indeed, Tunguska event is the largest uh, catastrophe which we uh, recorded, I mean, we humans in the whole history. We have 5,000 uh, history of recording, and there was nothing during all this time more uh, dramatic, more dangerous than the one which happened in Tunguska. Actually, humans were lucky because of being this event just three, year, three hours later, sorry, not three, five hours later, and it will uh, fell not in uh, Siberia, where no, no many people live at all, but it will fall on St. Uh, Petersburg. So the whole capital of the country will be vanished. Because of could you imagine 50 kilometers in diameter, the whole, everything what was there was uh, laid down. And this is a picture of it. You already saw it. In uh, uh, 1920s, Kulik was the first who started systematic uh, uh, expeditions to explore the place. And it was he, for, for, uh, practically, who, made, who brought the first scientific results of this type. And since that time, especially starting from 1950s, and every year till now, there are constantly combined Tunguska meteorite expeditions. They are self-organized, uh, so no money from government. So people cast it by themselves and they explore what's going on there. Together with they collect testimonies. It will happen in the 60s and 70s. So could you imagine people already witnessed this 1908, and the first scientist who asked them, <laughs> asked them in 1970s. So till now, 
we have, this is a website where all testimonies gathered. Till now we have 1984 testimonies. There are about, some of them are very simple, like I heard something and I saw something or my friend saw something. But anyway, everything was recorded and uh, in original language without any inter uh, any additions from a person who wrote down. And out of all of them, about 600 uh, have kinematic records. Uh, so they point where uh, some data which could be used to restore the trajectory of an asteroid. And uh, in 1988, there was uh, most probably the first uh, accurate publication. It uh, based on 300 observers, uh, uh, testimonies of observation. And uh, this is a result from this uh, research. So uh, what was bad, too much time passed since the uh, real uh, event till the time when a uh, witness was asked. But uh, what's good, we know precisely one point of the trajectory because of we know where is epicenter. So the only thing what's left is the direction from where the asteroid come to that point. And if this is the sky over epicenter, then the morning of 30th of June, the sun was here practically precisely on east. It was seven o'clock, 17 minutes local time. And the reconstruction said that uh, most probably the center of from where it come lays somewhere here. So azimuth is 125 degrees and altitude is to uh, 20 degrees over horizon. Okay, now we have good software. So we are on the Earth, Tunguska, and uh, this is the date, 7 uh, 17 local time. And the sun is somewhere here over east. Yes, it uh, looks like it was written in the article. Let's add grid. So here we are. This is 90, 100, 110, 20, 25. So somewhere here. Yes, somewhere here should be our radiance. So most probably from here, based on 300 testimonies, we have uh, the asteroid, uh, sorry, the body, Tunguska body should, uh, should come to the epicenter. Okay, let's remove the daylight. So we have the sun here and stars around, and we could see that it is not far from Orion Belt, just Orion Belt and the same distance at the top. So somewhere here it should come. If we look what's go, what happened those days around the Earth, we would see that near the Earth on 30th of June, there was comet Enke and it flight from the direction from the sun. So Enke went this direction and the Earth goes this direction. So comet goes, was very close to us and uh, uh, but uh, very close, uh, it's relatively very close. It's uh, about five, uh, 50 million kilometers away. But what we have good, good news is that uh, these days we discovered a minor meteor shower at, no, uh, at the point which is named Beta Tower. It's in fact, now it is not next to star Beta, it's next to star Zeta. Uh, but uh, what's interesting, it's maximum 29th of June and its parent body, it was discovered recently, 2004 TG10. Its parent body has exactly the same characteristics which belongs to comet Enke. I mean, uh, when I say exactly the same, I mean uh, position of perihelium, eccentricity, and so on, period, and so on. So we consider that this body is part of comet Enke. And it was discovered only in 2004, that's all. It's small, it's just one kilometer size. And uh, we name it uh, near Earth objects because of it's really past, not far from us. And this body is connected with this a meteor shower. And our comet was at the time very uh, low on the horizon. So chances are really very large that Tunguska uh, event is in fact part of comet Enke. 
and it just met with the Earth. Same period, same time, exactly the same like comet and goes. So that's what we have, and that's really interesting. It's based just on uh, asking people how the, uh, the event happened from their point of view, which happened <laughs> many, let's count, 60 years before they were asked. Okay, our next talk will be about searching of uh, asteroids, and it will be presented by Vida Emir Shamsi, if I correctly pronounce her last name. Yes, correct. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good evening and happy asteroid day. Uh, my name is Vida Emir Shamsi. I'm an electrical engineer and a, science, a citizen scientist at Kition Planetarium and Observatory. I participate in asteroid research programs. We are in cooperation with NASA and using telescope in Hawaii. Here, this is an animated, you, you can see it. This is an animated image that we have to analyze to research for asteroids. Uh, we have a screen, we have background full of stars, and we have to search for moving objects like this one. I'm showing you. And we have here, we can see an image from our software, the red, these two, uh, the red names are already discovered, and these purples we discovered by analyzing the images. The, un uh, the animated video uh, consists of four images. We have to show the new object in all four images here. So for, uh, for every image, we get the co uh, cooperate, coordinates, uh, sorry, coordinates. And here, when we zoom in on the object we found, it, we can see the asteroid like this. And we give it a name, like here, we give it an, a name, uh, which consists of three letters and four numbers. Here, KPO means Kition Planetarium and Observatory, and these four numbers means uh, the number of the asteroid. And also, a Minor Planet Center gives it another name, uh, according to the year of discovery and its orbit. And here, today, our asteroids can be found here between Mars and Jupiter in main asteroid belt. And also, you can find all the details about the asteroid and its orbit here online on the website. And I, I need to say thanks to, to the Kition Planetarium Observatory um, to, give, to give me this opportunity to be part of the projects and thanks all to, uh, for, li <coughs> for listening. Thank you very much, Vida. I think it is your first talk at the planetarium, is it correct? Yes, it's your first talk. Thank you very much, Vida. Doing well. And now we have uh, Katie Dimitriou, a space scientist. Uh, she will talk about exploration of asteroids. Katie? Yep. Am I muted? Yeah. Hang on. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to share my screen. Mm 
So, hi everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. So I'm Katie Limidru and I'm a space scientist and I've been working with the planetarium as part of the team for quite a few years now. And I'm very happy once again to actually celebrate this event, uh, this big international event and be part of uh, the Cypriot contribution to this. So I'm gonna talk about asteroid exploration. And um, I know that in the introduction, George covered a few things that I'm gonna to touch on and I'm very grateful for that. So it makes my job a little bit easier. So why explore asteroids? So why do we bother going and, and sending all these missions and uh, finding out their trajectories, et cetera, from the ground? Well, this is why. This is, this is my, like, my passion, something that I'm very, very interested in. So they can provide a way of finding out about how our solar system began, how life, which essentially leads on to life on Earth. So they provide some really direct evidence about the origins of our solar system. Um, and going on to the future, they also may provide valuable resources that will actually help us continue living um, without de destroying our own planet. So at the beginning of our solar system, we believe that we were a pile of dust and debris. So when you look to the sky and you see the Orion Nebula in the winter, um, 4.6 billion years ago, our solar system was something like that, like a bunch of dust. And with time, gravitational forces slowly cause those bunches of dust to clump together and form rocks and then bigger rocks and more rocks. And the center of this swirling mass of gas, um, it became so dense and hot that boom, the sun was created and nuclear fusion happened. Uh, this was a very turbulent time in our solar system. There were lots of big collisions. And some of these, these collisions, some, some of this, uh, this kind of formation of these objects was successful leading onto the planet. Now the asteroid belt is a region where there wasn't quite such a success. So a planet was never formed and uh, a lot of the stuff in that region is really primitive, really, really old. So if we go and investigate that matter that lies in the asteroid belt, the asteroids, we get a picture of what our solar system was like these 4.6 billion years ago, 4.5 billion years ago, 4.3, you know, it's so exciting that, I mean, I know, I know it's ancient, but it's exciting because we get to see our origins. Um, so one of the ways we can do this is with telescopes, as Vida uh, talked about in the previous talk, that we can observe these objects, we can map them, and we can find out what their composition is. So there's a, a technique called spectro spectroscopy, where we can actually look at the light reflected off these asteroids and figure out what minerals these asteroids contain. And we can group asteroids into various categories. Basically, they're either rocks uh, or composition of rocks uh, um, uh, with a few minerals in different compositions, or they can be metallic. And metallic ones are the in thing at the moment. Okay, so we started exploring asteroids with missions going directly to the asteroids in, in about 1989 when the Galileo probe passed an asteroid on its way to Jupiter and uh, the space agencies and the governments have invested a lot of time and money into carrying on these explorations because of the very big worth that it is to study an asteroid. So George touched on Hayabusa 2. Um, this was a very successful mission. It's still carrying out research so there is still the mission is still actually orbiting um, and going to another asteroid at the moment and the sample that it sent to the earth landed on the ground in December 2020 and it was actually a huge sample of 5.4 grams and this sample was distribu 
distributed to many labs throughout the world. And research is ongoing on this. And uh, the most recent discovery from about a week ago was that the material from the asteroid that Hayabusa 2 visited, Ryu, is very ancient. I mean, we're talking about is is it's probably some of the most ancient material that we've ever got our hands on from uh, ever. Uh, and it's very unaffected by environmental conditions. So when we get samples of asteroids, which land on the ground in the form of meteorites, they've been affected by high temperatures and they've been affected by weathering if we find them lying on the ground. But this sample from Hayabusa is pristine and exciting and it's still being researched one and a half years later. OSIRIS-REx is another sample mission, again to a rocky, a stony rocky asteroid. And we have a whacking 59 gram, 0.5 grams of material coming back to us, which will land somewhere in the States, in Utah, I believe, uh, next year on the 23rd of September. So. OSIRIS-REx collected its sample from Bennu, and you can see here a, a schematic of how big Bennu actually is. And this will be by far the largest sample from an asteroid ever that will be hopefully, fingers crossed, deposited on Earth on the 23rd of September, 2023. So, as I said, there's stony, rocky asteroids and there's metallic asteroids. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is the Earth. So this is a, a, a diagram that I took from a kid's website. And uh, just to refresh your memories, basically the Earth is consisting, we, we, we know it consists of many layers. And the reason we know this is indirect measurements from seismic waves. We know that the inside of the Earth is actually metallic and it's solid. So but there's no way we can get to the inside of the Earth. So how can we study it apart from indirect measurements? Well, we can send a mission to one of the asteroids that is metallic. Because as I said at the beginning of the presentation, um, 4.6, 4.5 billion years ago when the solar system was first forming, there were lots of clumps of rock and some of them did not form a planet, but they formed a protoplanet and may have been uh, involved in collisions and destroyed. So there are some asteroids, metallic asteroids, that we believe are actually cause of planets that did not survive. So Psyche is a mission that is going to explore one of these worlds, it's not made of rock, it's metal. And we believe that it may be the core of an unformed, a planet that didn't didn't, wasn't successful, say like the Earth, that it, it was destroyed before it, could, it, it didn't survive. So we're actually gonna go there on this mission and explore this asteroid and I can't wait to, to to see the results. In fact, I was really disappointed when George told me uh, yesterday that the launch was delayed because when I prepared for this presentation, the launch was delayed only a month and now it's been delayed a whole year. Okay, so I quickly jotted over the launch diagram. So in a year, the next launch window is, is gonna approach and so Psyche, this mission to explore the metallic asteroid will be launched in 2023 in July or August, and it will arrive at Psyche in January 2027 and spend 21 months studying that really special asteroid. So um, that's the end of my talk, very short, short uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. A any questions? Excellent presentation, KD. Thank you very much. You. Uh, we are also disappointed about mm. Psyche. We're waiting uh, for a long time to be launched. And uh, the message came two days ago from our mm -hmm. uh, global coordinator 
be careful what you're going to say about <laughs> Psyche is not launching for the next launch window. It's July 23rd or, uh, or later on in August. So uh, yes, a bit disappointed, but it will happen. So thank you very much, uh, Alexander. Can you introduce our two uh, young scientists, please? Uh, some time ago, it happened in 2020, it was in the, practically now we may say in the middle of uh, pandemic situation, we started in planetarium uh, program which is named uh, Summer Challenge and it, uh, it was idea, the idea was to uh, introduce uh, the topic of uh, which is available for school level students or for uh, just uh, uh, students of universities uh, that uh, will allow them to calculate the trajectory of fireball based on uh, testimonies. And uh, we had a good example because of that very year in 2020, uh, there was a very la uh, large a result of one flight of a fireball in uh, 20th of January. It was so good condition for Cyprus. It was uh, at evening, so everyone could see it, but it was not very late. So many people were out. Though it was in January, still conditions were good. So we, we collected more than 200 testimonies and many videos of the event. So, in planetarium, we had good data, good amount of data, and we want to proceed it according to our article, which we published based on another star, uh, fireball over Cyprus. It happened in 2016. In 2016, it was so uh, huge event that everyone, uh, no, sorry, not everyone, that all over Cyprus, many people, uh, people call police and ask what's happened. And police in the middle of night, practically midnight, search for, for the remnants of what happened. So it was uh, impressive that time. And uh, we wrote an article and we proposed a program how to reconstruct uh, the fireball trajectory. So this task uh, is presented now by students who participated in summer challenge. And uh, I would like to introduce Maxim Verovkin. He just now, one week ago, graduated uh, his school. He got uh, certificate. So he uh, graduated from LITC school in Limassol. And he will present us computer aid simulation of fireball trajectories based on observers, based on uh, testimonies. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. So do you, do you hear me, first of all? And yeah, do you see my screen? I'm Maxim Vierkin, and uh, today I'll talk about the current state of the project that I have been involved in for the last two years. Uh, the goal of this project is to create a program that would calculate the trajectory of a fireball based on German observations. And the secondary goal is to make this program fast. And this is one of the reasons that the current implementation is written in Rust programming language, even though the first prototypes were written in Python. And uh, this program is open source and it is hosted on my GitHub. The links will be in a few slides later. Uh, this project relies on two databases. The first one is International Meteor Organization Database, or IMO for short. Uh, so when someone observes a fireball, they are free to report it to, on IMO's website. And the data becomes available for researchers all over the world to use. For example, we use data from the site. And the site the second database is NASA database. Uh, uh, it provides accurate information for many age set events. Uh, by choosing events that are represented in both databases, we can test the program and verify the behavior. So, for example, Cyprus is presented there, the event that was talked a few moments later uh, previously. <laughs> yes, so we can check our program with this database. And uh, our program is allowed to make two very major assumptions. And the first is that the trajectory is just straight line, straight line. The second one is that the velocity doesn't change over time. And actually it's Dmitry's project, which we'll hear about in a few minutes, that will or will not prove those assumptions. 
by normalizing videos. Um, before getting to the actual algorithm, we have to define an ev evaluation function. Uh, it lets us automatically compare two possible answers and choose which better suits a given observation. And in our case, it returns three numbers, one for the beginning of the observation, one for the end, and one for the distant angle, because we choose to decouple those uh, variables for the reasons we'll discuss a bit later. Um, the image on the right visually shows those three numbers and where they came from. So the red line describes illustrates the proposed answer. Uh, green line arrow illustrates the observation's distant angle. And those two green dots visualize the beginning and the end of the observation. And so we have three numbers which we can analyze to evaluate our proposed answer. Uh, as you can see in this slide on the left, the so bottom left corner, there is a link to the source code that points, in this case, to the actual evaluation function that, it, that is written in Rust. If you want to learn more, you can follow this link and see the actual code that, uh, that calculates these values. And on the next slides, there will also be these links where, where it makes sense. Um, so in this slide, you can see so-called pipeline of the program at least I call it so. Uh, it consists of five steps, and we'll take a closer look at each of those in a few next slides. So the first one is to calculate .kml files to .common files. As it turns out, IMO database lets us download data in only .kml files. And on this slide, you can see a fragment of this file, and it is far from being human readable. It is a complex data file data type uh, so we can we convert it to toml file which is much more simpler and is actually human readable again on the slide you can see an example which is it's simple um, also i chose toml because uh, rust can automatically deserialize it into the memory and so it is very convenient we have to convert this file only once and then run a program any time soon um, from our experience, you know that people remember the distant angle much more reliably than the rest of the details. And actually, for, throughout the development of the program, there was an intermediate state when the program's evaluation function would take into account only the distant angle. And the proper program would still give some same results. And so we decided that we can enhance the rest of the data to match the distant angle. In this example on the slides, you can see uh, like before and after, uh, before the distant angle that the observer set and the actual data that they presented uh, doesn't match up because it is decoupled on the side. So uh, by assuming that the distant angle is probably correct, we can my, we can tweak the rest of the data to match it more better. Um, <clears throat> if, you, if you always had only two observations and if you ignore this angle, then the observer, then the answer would be well defined and trivial to find by simply intersecting the plane in which each observation lies. And since actually, usually we have way more than just two observations, we can calculate the answer for each pair and then find the average. Or in our case, we find the weighted average uh, because for the parallel planes, we assign a weight of zero because they don't give us much information. And the planes that intersect under a right angle are the most valuable and they're weighted with a value of one. Um, then we improve the answer by using a robust algorithm called least median of square, least median of squares. It is a Monte Carlo algorithm, which is actually a fancy way to say that it is randomized. And of course it is a bit more intelligent than just randomly guessing an answer until we have something same. And the, rob the robustness of the algorithm means that it should work on logged data and we will see it in action in a few slides. Uh, the algorithm is split into three steps. At first, we use the actual least median of squares. 
Uh, after them, we assign each part of each observation a weight. And I want to emphasize that we assign weights to each individual part of the observation. So if someone um, reported a correct descent angle, but uh, incorrect uh, start, beginning of the end, because it is uh, actually pretty common in the data set to have good descent angles, but about everything else. Uh, we have to assign the weights to each element separately because we don't want to lose valuable data. And um, after that, we use weighted least squares algorithm to improve the answer even further. Uh, on the slide, you can see the link to the original research, which goes into much more deeper details. I recommend visiting it because it basically explains this algorithm in details. And after that, uh, we can slightly enhance the answer with gradient descent. It is a pretty simple procedure in which we numerically take the partial derivative of the evaluation function and move each component of the answer in such a way to minimize this function, evaluation function. Uh, we assume that the function is smooth because we are already near the answer. And that's why we are allowed to take this partial derivative. Um, there is a helper program that randomly generates the data that can be used as input to our program uh, in order to verify its behavior. Uh, the data generator has a few parameters you can see, uh, such as number of observations, uh, standard deviation, and such. For example, we have configured plugging to 20% or, or anything else. And as you can see on the table on the right, uh, our current algorithm works pretty much perfectly until the clothing hits 25%. So if most of the data is correct, then it will probably work. Uh, obviously, for more, there is less actual data than just random garbage, then it doesn't work. But I had to test it. So, yeah. Uh, this is actually one other reason why I decided to write this program in Rust because uh, Rust has this, func this functionality built in. So it's called integra <laughs> integration testing. Uh, this is when you write a function that can test the entire program by generating that input to it and verify the output. And, um, on this slide, you can see the current results on real world data. Uh, what I want to mention the most is uh, Denmark, because it has the, less, the least amount of observer, observers, just 22. And surprisingly, it has by far the best answer. <laughs> I don't have an explanation for this yet, but this is what some. Um, so for the improvements, uh, first of all, right now we don't calculate the standard deviation of the answer that we provide. So we don't actually know the accuracy of those answers. And it's, this is work it on right now. This is a prioritized task. And uh, then we can use multiple threads for better performance. Right now the program is single threaded and on most modern computers there are tens of threads. So it can be made really fast, like an order of magnitude faster. And uh, finally, we can we should investigate why Denmark result is better than others. Maybe it's just the quality of data that is very good. So, but we, we should investigate it. We didn't yet. And thank you all for your attention. I while preparing this. Um, Report, I found a few bugs in the program, so it was very helpful for me too. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Maxime, congratulations for your great uh, work you're doing. Thank you for cooperating with us and trusting us. And I also like to thank Alexander, who is always with you, uh, Prompt. And uh, if I judge from the, if the the one, the, the, not the last one, but the one before the last uh, slide, 
Denmark had one value better and the other one was not as, bad, as, as good as ours, yes? Only the first value was better in Denmark. Is that correct? Uh, in Denmark, uh, no, it actually everything is better. Do I share my screen? Yeah, I do. But there are more kilometers for the cluster. Uh, no, it's just five kilometers, which is mm -hmm. interesting. Oh, okay. While others are 50 and Netherlands mm -hmm. is the first one. Ah, it was Netherlands or 55. Okay, so, yeah, I remember that. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. But okay. still, have a look on the Earth. You say where it should, uh, based on observers, you, sh you may say where the epicenter happened. Uh, just for the accuracy, uh, the Earth 12,000 kilometers in diameter, and here we have 100 kilometer in accuracy. So it's still not very bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent work. Another talk, this talk is based on video data. Again, in uh, the event 2020 or 121, so that day, uh, some cameras occasionally, from, uh, they are not special cameras from uh, scientists, but they are occasional cameras, they register this uh, fireball. And uh, we have separate data, it's not just one, but few of them. So that's why uh, uh, proceeding with this camera and proceeding with, the, uh, with uh, still images uh, is a uh, work which Dmitry took. So welcome Dmitry Dubishkin, student of Mediterranean Marine Academy. And uh, before Dmitry, uh, I would like to thank again in public our friend, which is always happens to uh, for the uh, fire force to be in front of the camera and she sends us all the videos yeah, in addition to the other videos. So it's always has, she always has a video for us. So we would like to thank her again. Okay, so greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I would like to tell you a few things about computer-aided simulation of fireball trajectories based on video data. Let us begin. So the purposes of the project are the, are the processing of after event images and calculation of the fireball's average speed. Let me explain the first one. Here I have a, an image from school student Mrs. Lem, Mrs. L from Pentacomo. She observed a fireball that fly at above the Mediterranean Sea 24 March 2021 and she took an after event image and marked two points on the fireball's trajectory mm -hmm. now we now we need to find this azim, azimus and the altitude in, or, in order to reconstruct the fireball's trajectory so the first thing to to do is to take two two points on the surface with the known geographical coordinates and here they are yeah, also we have ob observers approximate coordinates and we need pixel coordinates of them of all four points now based on this data of the geographical coordinates of points a and b we, we can calculate their az azimus and the altitude and now we can calculate the, the scale of the image. How many pixel, how many degrees do we have on each pixel? Mm -hmm. So in our case is 0 0.041 degree per pixel. And now we and now we can calculate the azimuthal coordinates of these two points. Thanks to the plane. Thanks to the planet kids in planetarium and observatory, I enrolled in their in their summer challenge program and and I learned how to how to calculate the azimuthal coordinates of the of the any point in on the image based on on geographical coordinates and pixel data. So the azimuth of the first point is one one sixty three and the the altitude is nearly 12 degrees and the second point is 154 and 8.5 altitude. 
let me show you another another after event photo mistress marisa from nicosia to also observe this specific fireball but from different direction and she took an after event photo of the of the sky and mark it mark is the trajectory of the fireball mm -hmm. here we have to repeat the same procedure we we take two two points with known geographical coordinates we take the pixel pixel coordinates of of points and then we can then we can calculate the scale of the image in this case is 0 0.13 degree per pixel and now we can we can calcul calculate the, the azimuthal coordinates of these two points let let me show you something here we do, the point a is uh, is located at this point on the map and the and the point b is approximately here at this hill as you can see and marisa observed the fireball from this crossroad in nicosia mm -hmm. so as you as you could see and even after event images from random cameras are very helpful for this for the specialists for in re, for reconstruct for reconstructing the trajectory of the fireball any eye, eyewitness can take an after event photo and send it to the spe specialist for proce processing and now let's and now let's see how we proce process the video here we have videos from ca for cameras of the of the fireballs that fly over the mediterranean sea at 20 20 january the year 2020 there are two two cameras from cyprus mr joe from paphos and mr kasapis from and mr kasapis and here we have two cameras two other cameras this is camera from mistress k from from israel this video was suggested to us by mistress erin hai and and here we have a video from lebanon from mr moore let's see the video as you can see the fireball flying down in different direction in each in each video and now with we have the brightest brightest point of the of the fireball we can easily observe the the horizon line here here and even here the whole the duration of the of light was 3.5 seconds mm -hmm. and now we, as you can see the the fireball fades out and now let's take a look at of how we proce process this this data here we have the map of our region there are two observers from cyprus mr joe from paphos mr kasapis israel and lebanon here you can see them their directions based on the azimuthal coordinates and and using these directions we can reconstruct the best cross the best cross point p1 based on data from these videos i reconstructed eight points from the fire fireball's trajectory and now when we have these eight points we can calculate the average speed of the fireball between two neighbor neighbor points which is the second purpose of our project here is the formula the average speed is equals with difference of positions of two points of divided over delta t v which is time between two moments that i that i choose by myself and also i have to mention that in this duration of 3.5 seconds when the fireball flies the earth is is turning around itself for and the observers are moving for approximately one kilometer we we should keep it in mind when 
doing our calcul calculations. And here you can see see a data sample for, for the program which processes all this data. In this case, from Mr. Kasapis, there are his approximate geographical coordinates, level over the sea, sea and his time zone. And here you can see the, the pixel coordinates which we, we got from, from his video. Those are the coordinates of eight cross points. We, no, no, no. These are the coordinates which we took from his video, the pixel coordinates. There are different for each observer, but the, but the time moment is, is, it, is the same for those observers. All videos are synchronized in order to reconstruct the trajectory. So what are the conclusions, conclusions of this project? After event photos from random cameras can provide accurate data to specialists to locate fireball in 3D space. Anyone can make those photos and send it to specialists to, to process them. This project has many opportunities for, for continuation. For example, in the future, we, we want to, rec to calculate each, each camera zoom to make our, our future reconstructions more accurate. And another, and another future plan is to is accurate reconstruction of the fireball's trajectory. There are the sources, for example, Kitchen Planet Planetarium and Observatory Fireballs Archive, and special thanks to the Kitchen Planetarium and Observatory for inviting me into this project. It, it allowed me to learn many new interesting things and even to create this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Do, do you have any questions? Feel free to ask. Congratulations, Dimitri. Very good job. Very impressive images. And as we can Thank see you, that everything happens accidentally. And I remember, and I mean, not, not, not accidentally, actually, so you, while you're doing an event, you suddenly have a fire port. I remember the, the event, Alexander, remember we were, had this, we were celebrating in October, the in the West Space, United Nations West Space Week, we were in Gadotris village on the mountain, and suddenly, as we were giving the lecture, everybody turned and said, "Wow!" It was an amazing feeling, you know. So those who missed it, they were disappointed, but those who saw it, they started talking about it, trying to see, uh, uh, trying to to uh, looking at the sky to see when when the tail where the, the tail was painted and uh, disappeared after a couple of seconds and uh, it was uh, people were very enthusiastic and they they show they showed immediately after this natural phenomenon they are um, they were eager to to start to study more things about astronomy mm -hmm. and uh, these two children these two not children, because they're grown up now, they were going to, univer they're going to university. They were, uh, they had this passion from uh, the young, from a uh, very young age, both Maxime and uh, Dimitri, and they are with us uh, for uh, many years. They are doing great job. They are always willing, and they're also volunteering to help us for uh, other events. Uh, and they are great people, great characters, but they also do very good scientific work. Uh, congratulations for, to both of you, Maxime and, and Dimitri. Thank you. Keep up the good work and I wish you all the best for your future. Thank you very much, George. So our next talk is uh, to George Trulias, director of the Kitano Planetarium and Observatory, because of he wants to announce new asteroid discoveries made here. So I would like to mention that uh, uh, we are going, before we close the event, we want to announce our discoveries of, uh, officially of uh, the asteroids. And um, I would like to say that this uh, uh, citizen scientist uh, project, it's a cooperation between uh, NASA, the Hutchinson University, 
Catalina Sky Surveying Pastors, and uh, we're using uh, two telescopes in Hawaii. Uh, one is 1.8 meters, the other one is 2.1 meters. And they are rich Ukrainian uh, configuration, and uh, they're using CCD cameras. And we are using a database called Net PPM Excel. So we load the database as uh, our colleague and Vida uh, described earlier in the in her talk. Uh, most probably you remember there were some uh, there's a background of the stars and you can search for the moving objects. Then we have the, we get the light curve, we get the magnitude, we can estimate the speed, and we can get into more details uh, and then calculate the trajectory. So when we first discovered these objects, they are called preliminary discoveries. Uh, of course, we load the database and we know which are the new discoveries. And if they have, if they return a, a certain signal to noise ratio, and if they have, uh, if they have, uh, if they follow the same uh, a constant uh, velocity, then uh, they are also checked. And if they are observed again, they are confirmed as preliminary discoveries. Now, if more and more observers observe them and then we, we are able to correct and calculate the, the trajectory, then they become from preliminary discoveries to provisional discoveries. And then uh, NASA works out with the certificates for the discovery of these objects as the first people who discovered these objects. So, we are um, we are in uh, this uh, project since 2017. Uh, we've managed to uh, grow the teams. We also managed with the help of Kedney Mitreou. And uh, last year we had another two extra teams in uh, English school. This year uh, we'll have, uh, hopefully we'll build a team for the American Academy if they are interested. So we're talking about two private schools with people that they are of very high standard of uh, uh, of education and uh, uh, in these two schools. So um, they 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 show interest and people that they start from here usually become astronomers. As for this is we have a lot of examples in our fifteen years of existence of our science center. Many of them that came here for us for work experience. They ended up with PhDs, and now we uh, we have postdoctorates as well. So uh, we are proud of them, and we are proud that they went further than us as well. Uh, so uh, this science, uh, citizen science projects, we try to involve um, people from the public, uh, from the general public or students, and. Uh, we make this discovery, so they are involved in real scientific research. So the first one that uh, was discovered was 2019, the 2019 and 16. It was uh, a group of uh, uh, volunteers and uh, some university students and uh, one uh, ly lyceum student and a teacher. So uh, it was, uh, I remember when uh, we received the, they mail from uh, NASA, they told us that it, we have uh, managed to get, uh, um, not a preliminary, but a provisional discovery. I remember we were all here trying to send the final report and we are running around the observatory, celebrating, jumping around, we got the pizza and celebrating. So then it was the second one. Again, we were happy and uh, slowly, slowly we started to, uh, by gaining experience spotting some more, even more faint uh, asteroids that could not be spotted from other teams. And uh, so we discovered another three in 2020 and another two in 2021. Uh, so uh, these are the asteroids that uh, were discovered by our team. So if we uh, are able to confirm the trajectory and finally calculate it, uh, better then uh, the MP minor planet center will come and uh, give us the chance to name these asteroids with names. So asteroids and uh, comets can be given names of the discoverers or 
uh, anyone, but if you are dealing with any other celestial objects, if I'm not mistaken, you may correct me, Joyce, if you know, I think that the, the person, the name given should be, uh, should have passed away at least 100 years to give the name to an exoplanet, for example, if I remember well the rules for the other projects. But for the asteroids and the comet, you can give the name of the discoverer or the team. So if you are interested to join our team, join us on August 22nd to September 16th is our next campaign. So join our space work. So from our team here, we wish you all happy asteroid day. And uh, we will post this video online on our YouTube channel. You can go to the website astronomycyprus.eu. And uh, if I stop sharing, uh, you may see here <laughs> the Astronomy Cyprus to the EU, our website. Uh, you can share it. You can use uh, the hashtags Asteroid Day or AD2022 or KPO Cyprus. And you can share the event. Uh, you can post anything related to Asteroid Day. You can use uh, the hashtags. And uh, you can find previous recordings of, from other Science Cafe and other Asteroid Days on our YouTube channel. That uh, the link you can, you can find in the top right corner of our website when you enter our website. So thank you all for being with us. We're looking forward to seeing you in our next Science Cafe, Tuesday, July the 26th. Um, uh, we are going to announce the topic very soon. Um, so if anyone would like to give a presentation and share with us your knowledge, uh, you may join, you just drop us a, an email, uh, chat with us on Messenger, on WhatsApp, or contact us in some way, so we can arrange for you to give a lecture on uh, our uh, online science cafe. If you have any questions, we're here to answer them. And once again, thank you for being with us and happy Asteroid Day.